This program was brought to you by the Gospel Partners of Matthew Ochoa Ministries. Find out later how you can become a Gospel Partner today. I'm not the sick trying to be healed. I'm the healed resisting sickness. Amen? It's in the anointing that's on your life that enables you to do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Hey, welcome back to Rooted and Grounded. I'm Matthew Ochoa, and I'm so glad you're joining me today for this broadcast. If you're just tuning in with us, we're ending this week of the power of purity, and we've been in this series for a couple of weeks now, and so I encourage you to go back and listen to all these teachings that we have on this topic. I, I believe it'll bless you. And we're, we're talking about purifying our lives so that we can see God more clearly. We can know His will for our life better, uh, know what he, what he wants for us and what His Word says. So I encourage you to get the whole teaching. We have it available on our website for free. You can watch every video for free, listen to all these, these messages for free as well. You can get it as a DVD, a CD, down, a CD or MP3 download on our website as well. You can get these as a, as a suggested donation we have available on there. Uh, we also have a book called The Power of Purity that is available for you as well. Just uh, it's a, a, For a gift of any amount, you can get this book when you write us or call us today. And we really encourage you to get this teaching because I believe it'll bless you. I think it'll, it'll really help understand how we can change certain aspects to our life uh, for the, just the better of us understanding what God wants for us to do. And most people, they shy away from the teaching of purity because they think it talks about legalism or, or just religious works or things like that of that nature. But the reality is purifying our life isn't works. It's not a works-based mentality. It's, it's for us to see God, to hear God better. It's not for God to bless us more. It's not for God to, to do things in our life better. It's for us, it's solely for us to have a better relationship with the Lord and for us to see Him more clearly in our life because oftentimes we have distractions, things that come uh, in between us and the Lord. And if we can learn how to purify our lives and free our lives from those contaminations and, and distractions, then we can have a successful Christian life. And I believe you can walk into all that God's called you to walk into. So I want to encourage you to get this teaching again on our website at MatthewOchoa.com. I believe it'll bless you. You can get the book as well. And if you want to become a partner with the ministry, we would love for you to do that as well on our website. Um, you can become a partner for as little as $10 a month. And what that does is it helps us get these materials into the hands of people all over the world. We have people here in the U.S. that request these materials pretty often. And we also have people in, in Africa and in Europe nations and stuff like that that, uh, that would love to get these materials as well. And so when you partner with us, you enable us to send those out for free. We don't charge them for these materials. We cover shipping costs, production costs, everything, just so that they can get the gospel in their possession. So those of you who have partnered with us, we thank you for your partnership. We appreciate you. We believe God, that God has, has done great things in the ministry. And when you partner with us and when you do that part and you, you impact other people's lives, I believe that you have great things in store for your life, that you 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 are accessing things that you couldn't access otherwise. And when you give to the kingdom, when you give to his to the gospel being preached, there's a great blessing that comes on your life because of it. So I would love for you to become a gospel partner today. Just ask the Lord if that's what he has you, uh, would have you to do here in the ministry. We would love for you to partner with us. So we ended the last episode talking about the way Jesus can think, the way Jesus thinks about certain things in, our, in life and how we can change the way we think to how Jesus thinks. And if you're just watching for the very first time, you might be asking, well, how, how can I think like Jesus? Jesus was Jesus. I mean, he was God. Well, yeah, he was God, but he was also 100% man. He was, he was a man. He was God in a man's body. And he was limited to the, to the physical limitations that our natural body has. He, he had the same type of mind we have. He has the same fleshly body that we have. I mean, every, every single whip, every punch, the crown of thorns, everything that he took on his body, he felt it. It was physical. He felt that because he has a physical body. And the Bible says that Jesus, he grew in wisdom, favor, and stature throughout his life. And throughout his life, he had to, he had to grow just like everybody else. He had to grow in wisdom. He had to learn. He had to become smart. 
He didn't come out of the womb speaking Hebrew and Aramaic. He had to learn those things. He had to learn those, those languages. Um, and just like that, I mean, he grew as a child and he grew to a toddler from a baby and then from a, from a toddler to a young child, from a child to a teenager and to eventually an adult. And that's because he was human. He was a man. And the way Jesus operated on this earth was through the body and through the mind of a man. Now, now he was perfect, he was sinless, he was the perfect righteous being that ever lived on the earth, and so there were benefits to that. But most of the things that he did was because he was a man. The healings that took place, he didn't do it because he was God, he did it because he was a man utilizing the authority and power of God. In fact, Jesus said, I don't do anything except from what I've seen the Father do. I don't say anything from except what I've seen the Father say. He didn't act independently of God. He, God, he was God, but he moved and did things according to what God wanted him to do. And through that, he had to exercise his flesh, exercise his mind to do these things and overcome his physical limitations. And just like that, God has given us the same ability I know some of you might think that's blasphemy or, or I'm, I'm preaching something that's heresy. But this is what the scripture says in, Col- in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says, The natural man, in verse 14, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So it says that we have the mind of Christ. We can think like him. We can think the way he thinks, but we have to get past our physical limitations. And one of those limitations is our natural mind, the way we think with our natural mind. Our natural mind just deals with logic, deals with reasoning, how we can think. And if it doesn't make sense logically, if we can't figure it out logically, then most of the time the conclusion is it just doesn't work. But with, with the mind of Christ, we can see things from a different perspective, like Jesus. And so we talked about a couple of instances on, on what happened in, in, in the life of Jesus and what he did concerning the way he thought. There was a young girl who was on her deathbed and she was dying and Jesus walked into the room and everyone was weeping and mourning and crying, which is a normal response that most people would do because they think it's the end. But Jesus thinks a different way. When we think it's the end, Jesus says it's just the beginning. And so he looked at everyone and said, well, why are you crying? She's not dead, she's just sleeping. And it says they all ridiculed him and they all mocked him because they thought she was dead. And this is exactly going in, in uh, tandem with that previous scripture in 1 Corinthians saying that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. The Spirit of God said, this, this girl is not dead, she's sleeping. But the natural man and all of those people, it was foolishness to them. And so they mocked him, they ridiculed him. And that's what's gonna happen in your life when you start believing God for awesome things to take place, when you start believing God for supernatural miracles, when you believe God for, for seeing blind eyes open, deaf ears open, the mute speaking, people raised from the dead. People are gonna ridicule you because it's foolishness to them. Their natural man does not receive it. And when people think that it's foolishness, all that they're really saying is they're not spiritual people. That's all that they're saying. They're just saying, you know what? I don't understand it with my natural man. And that's what I'm driven by. That's what I'm controlled by. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not driven by the spirit. If I was driven by the spirit, I'd understand this. I would agree with you. But most Christians, and it's unfortunate to say, most Christians are driven by the natural man. They are driven by the flesh. They're driven by, by natural things and not by the things of the spirit, not by the things of God. And because of it, they're not going to see all the great things God wants to do because the natural man does not receive from the things of God. So we have to get over that roadblock. We have to get past that obstacle of, of what, our, our, what this mind thinks and align it with what the spirit of God thinks, the way Jesus thinks in all of our circumstances. And we're not denying our circumstances. We're not denying reality. We're just acknowledging that there are better spiritual realities that we cannot see. 
So the next, the next thing I want to share with you is that a pure mind will produce fruit. A pure mind will produce fruit. So first we talked about how a pure mind will have peace. Then we said a pure mind will think like Jesus. And then we said a pure mind will produce fruit. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and he says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may also be clean. So this is fruit. We're going to get into the fruit of things now. And all that fruit is, is a result of what was planted in the first place. That's it. People, they, I don't know why the, the body of Christ likes to confuse things. But people think that fruit is, is specifically the fruits of the Spirit, which they include that, those things. But then I also, also hear other people saying, you know, the Bible says in John 15 that, that we're the vine, or he's the vine, we're the branches, and every branch in, in him bears fruit. And that fruit is only loving people and, and showing your love to people. There's so much more to fruit than just a simple action. Fruit is, is the evidence, it's the proof of whatever was planted in the first place. That's it. Fruit can be anything. Fruit can be, mean a lot of things. Fruit can mean you, you're demonstrating the healing power of God because you planted God's word on the inside. Fruit can also mean you're a very judgmental person because you planted that in your heart as well. You're a very mean person because you planted that in your heart. Fruit is whatever you planted in your heart becoming evident. That's all it is. And so when we see scriptures like this and, and we talk about producing fruit, yeah, it can mean producing fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, all those things. Or it also can mean whatever was planted in your heart that's evident now in your life, that is fruit. And so Jesus went to the Pharisees and he called them out. He said, you guys, you, you guys, you focus more on the fruit than you do on the root. You're focusing more on this outward stuff. But he said, clean first the inside. Then the outward becomes clean. I mean, these, these Pharisees, they, they were the best sinners ever. They, they, well, actually, they were the worst sinners because they, they thought they hardly sinned. They, they, they thought they were perfect. They thought they were righteous people through their actions. But he said, inside is full of extortion and self-indulgence. What a horrible place to be in. And for Jesus to, to say that about someone, you're full of self-indulgence. He said, first clean the inside, then the outside will become clean. Now, of course, Jesus was not being literal here. I mean, it doesn't take anyone to, to really understand that if you, if you only clean the inside of something, you have to clean the outside too. I mean, if you wash dishes, if you're, doing, if you're in the kitchen and you're washing all your dishes and you just clean the inside of the cup, but you don't touch the outside, the outside's gonna be dirty. You have to clean both the in and the out. So he wasn't talking about how to clean dishes. He wasn't talking about literally cleaning a cup and a dish. What he's talking about is the condition of your heart. The condition of the heart says that if you clean the inside, if you make sure you're, you purify your heart first, your actions will follow suit. The things you produce outwardly will begin to produce fruit. Another example of this that's great is, is ground, planting stuff into the ground. If you plant a seed in the ground, well, you have to first make sure that the ground is cultivated. You have to make sure the ground is free from debris and contaminants and weeds, and you have to make sure that it is pure ground. So when you plant the seed, it produces fruit. That's all he's talking about here. He's not talking about anything else but the condition of someone's heart. And when we clean our heart first, when we clean what's in here, and again, the heart is comprising the spirit and the soul of us. Our spirit is clean. That's already taken care of. So now we are left with our soul. We have to clean our soul. And when we clean our soul or clean the mind part of us, which is our imagination, how we think, what we think about people, how we think about ourselves, our viewpoint in life, once we do that and we purify that, 
then he says the outside will become clean. Our actions will become clean. Proverbs 23, seven says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. That's how his life is gonna go. And so here Jesus is saying it again, clean the inside first, then the outside will become clean. And that's what we're focusing on in this entire, entire uh, teaching, the power of purity, is cleaning first the inside, then watching how the outside will become clean. Watching how the outward appearance will be, begin to bear fruit from what's taking place on the inside. But the Pharisees, these people tried to live a holy life on the outside, yet their inside was filthy. Their inside was, was completely destroyed. It was full of extortion. Some verses even say full of dead man's bones. There was no life in there. It's hypocritical to clean up your public life when your private life is a mess. It's hypocritical to pretend and to save face and to say, oh yeah, everything is, everything is good. My life is going really well right now, but behind closed doors, it's a mess. It's a hypocritical life. And that's not a life that we're called to live. In fact, this is what happened with Jesus. Um, and he was walking and, and he was doing ministry and he came across this fig tree and he was hungry. And the, the Bible says that the fig tree, it showed that it had leaves. And if you don't know, a fig tree, when it shows that it has leaves, that means that it's ready to be plucked. There's, there's figs on it to be plucked. And so when Jesus went to the fig tree, he saw that the leaves were on it, but there were no figs because it wasn't in season. And so he looked at the fig tree, he talked to it, and he said, I command that there is no fruit, no figs to ever grow from your tree ever again. And that tree was cursed, it dried up from the roots, and it withered away the next day. But that fig tree was displaying a hypocritical life. On the outside, it said, I'm ready to pluck. I, I, I'm ready to be harvested. But there were no figs. There were no figs that were ready because it wasn't in season. And, and, and but what we can see from that scripture is that Jesus does not like hypocrites. He does not like when we try to have a double standard life. Because a double standard life is a double standard mind. If you're living a double standard life and, and you have all these things that look good, but behind closed doors, it doesn't look good, your, your mind will also be double. You'll have a double-minded life. And so we have to get rid of that double-mindedness. Again, become single-minded with the Father. And that has to do with cleaning up your soul, cleaning up the way you think. In John chapter 15, verse one, he says, I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. I once heard someone completely take this scripture out, of, scripture out of context by saying in verse two, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, if you don't know what pruning is, you, when you prune, um, when you prune any, any type of, of plant or tree, you cut it back. Right? If it's overgrown, you prune it and you cut it back to where it's manageable and to where it can start growing again and, and being more uh, productive. And so people have taken this literally, and like again, going back to the cup, he wasn't talking about cleaning an actual cup, he was using it as an illustration. Same thing is true here, he's not being literal. He's using this as an illustration because people have taken this to say, you know what, once you're successful in your Christian walk, God will cut you back, God will humble you, God will do all of these things to, to make sure that you're humble, that your ego doesn't get big enough, and he'll cut you back and cut you off so that you can bear more fruit. But that's not what he's talking about here. The word prune simply means to clean us, that's it. That's what you do when you're pruning trees and pruning plants, you're cleaning it. Now the process of pruning a plant is different than how you prune a human. You don't cut off things on a human. You, you clean a human differently. And that Jesus was saying that he cleans you. When you bear fruit, he cleans you even more so you can bear more fruit. And then the next verse, 
He says in verse 3, You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. So we can see here that the pruning process for us Christians isn't God cutting us back. It's being in his word. His word is what prunes us. His word is what cleans us. And so if, if we have all these distractions in our life and all these things that are causing us to, to not bear fruit, the answer to that or the remedy is to get in God's word, to clean your life to dis- of those distractions and re- get rid of those things that are keeping you from bearing fruit and get back into God's word, which will bear fruit in your life. It'll help you bear fruit. So branches that are severed, they can't bear any more fruit. So if, if, we, if we are completely severed from the, from the vine, if we are completely taken away from the vine, we won't bear fruit. The only way we can bear fruit is if we are one with him, if we are one with the vine. I mean, if, if you chop off a branch and you lay it on the ground and you say bear fruit, it's not gonna bear any fruit. It's not gonna grow anything because it's compl- the life has been taken from, the, from that branch. The, the life source it was connected to is no longer there, so it can't produce anything. And likewise with us, there's so many of us who are trying to bear, bear fruit and we're trying to produce things for God and do great things, yet we're completely severed from him. We're not, we're not connected to him. We're not with him. There can be points in, in the life of ministry where you're just doing so much ministry, you're not actually in relationship with God. You're not doing any fellowship with God. You're just doing busy work. That can happen as well. And so we have to make sure that any, any area of life that we're in, whether we're working a secular job or working a ministry job, we have to be connected to the branch or to the vine. We have to be connected to Jesus because once we can be connected to him, that's our life source. And then we can bear fruit. Then we can produce great things in our life. But we have to be pruned. We have to be clean. And that comes through God's word. God's word is what cleans us. And that's what helps us bear more fruit. We don't focus on bearing the fruit. That's not the focus. Focusing on bearing fruit is like focusing on your flesh, focusing on all of your actions. If you focus on your actions, that's only going to harden your heart and it's going to cause you to have trouble hearing God's voice. If you focus so much on, on not sinning and not doing this bad and not doing this wrong, chances are you're going to do those things even more because you're focusing more on those things. What you need to do is focus on the word. That's it. Focus on what God's word says. Listen to what God's word is telling you to do. And you're out of your heart that'll come. Out of your your heart being renewed and your mind being renewed, your actions will soon follow. One of the worst things I believe that we can do as believers is try to get people saved through a fear tactic. By saying, if you don't, I mean, here, here, you have to hear me out on this. I'm going to back myself up in a corner, but I'm going to try to get out of it. When you try to preach that people need to get saved or else they're going to go to hell, I mean, that can work. And it, it does work to a lot, for a lot of people. But for how long? How long until that fear tactic wears off? How long until that guilt wears away? I mean, people every single day are doing things to, to harden their hearts against guilt and against feeling bad. There's going to be a point where someone hears the word and and they hear someone say, you know, if you don't receive Jesus, you're going to go to hell. So receive him today. And because they don't want to go to hell, they become saved. But there's no relationship there. There's there's they didn't come to Jesus because of his goodness. They came to him because of the fear of hell. And that's not a good place to be at. We want to have a good relationship with Christ. In Romans, it says it's the goodness of God that draws people to repentance, not the fear of hell. And so when we preach hell and condemnation, I'm out of time today. I gotta continue the next week, but I ran out of time saying this. So I'll continue this on the next episode. Until I see you again, be blessed. This week, we are offering the complete teaching, The Power of Purity, in the form of a CD, DVD, or USB created from these videos. When you contact us, you can request a gift of any amount for each of these resources. When you donate to these materials, you are helping us get these same life-changing truths into the hands of people all over the world. To make a donation, visit MatthewOchoa.com today. We would like to express our gratitude to the gospel partners of Matthew Ochoa Ministries and Deep Rooted Church. 
Your generous donations help us provide free ministry materials to those in need. If you're not a gospel partner yet, please consider becoming one by donating $10 or more. Visit MatthewOchoa.com slash give to learn more about how you can become a gospel partner today. Hey, this is Pastor Matthew. I want to personally invite you to an awesome event that we're having here at Deep Rooted Church called Spirit Wind Conference. My great friend Elijah Morell is going to be here with us in Visalia again with a list of awesome dynamic speakers. And we are ready to give you what the Lord has put into our heart. It's going to be an awesome conference. It is November 11th all the way to the 15th. So it's going to be a jam-packed week filled with the Spirit, the Word, some awesome worship. I encourage you to be there. Again, it's my great friend Elijah Morrell who's hosting this conference. And we're just having the privilege of having him host it right here at Deep Rooted Church. So if you're in the area, if you're in Visalia, Tulare, Hanford, Fresno, or any of the surrounding areas here in the Central Valley, we would love for you to be a part of this five-day conference right here in Visalia, California at Deep Rooted Church. It's gonna be an amazing, amazing event. So please be here at Spirit Wind Conference in 2024, November the 11th, all the way to the 15th. your spirit and his spirit coming together to pick up the log, coming together to throw in the bucket because this well is deep, but you have something to draw with. His name is Holy Spirit. And God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power that works in you. He's waiting on you in the pasture. When you praise God, you strengthen yourself. When you praise the Lord, you're ordaining strength into your life. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can. I can do. I can do all things through Christ. You can walk through something, but that something does not have to walk on you. Do you understand? You're walking through. I want to give you the opportunity to invite Jesus into your heart today. If you've never received him, all you have to do is say this, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I acknowledge I need a savior. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. Tell me what to do. I invite the Holy Spirit to lead my life. Guide me. I love you, Jesus. I am all yours. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, amen. And if you just said that prayer today, it's that simple. And in fact, I want to give you a free gift today. It is a book called A New Life. It'll tell you everything you need to know about what you just did, what to do next, and what you can expect in your Christian walk with Jesus. So I encourage you, let us know if you've received Jesus for the first time today. We would love to celebrate with you. Just call the number that you see on the screen today. But until we see you again, be blessed and welcome to the family.